Battle Royales are all the rage right now. Fortnite, PUBG, Apex Legends, CSGO's Danger Zone, Call of Duty's Blackout, Pokemon Rumble? And now, it's Mario's turn. This blinding display of reckless experimentation was created by a funny person who goes by the username Inferno Plus. He has a YouTube channel, in fact, generally focused on silly videos involving the Souls games and similar ones like From Software's on Sekiro. Wish they would make another Another Centuries episode. Launched on June 15, Mario Royale is as simple as it gets. You pick a name and then you are quickly dropped off into a lobby together with countless other Marios. Until the match starts, you will be stuck in a small blocked area by two overly tall pipes so that you can contemplate how in the world did things end up this way. The coins and text on the other side of the pipes almost seem to be enjoying your confusion at the terrible fate you have met. And then, once the match starts, a flood of Marios will come pouring out of the castle, revealing no other than various levels from the original Super Mario Bros, just begging for you to spread your wings and fly, for you to see just how far you can go. You have the iconic first level with the game's unmistakable overworld level music. You have the underground stages with their classic blue-tinted designs. You even have the weird mushroom towers that honestly just kind of look like pizza. Tasty. Oh, and there are also some original levels thrown in too. But when I think Battle Royale, I think large play area with equipment scattered through it and players directly trying to kill each other. Mario Royale isn't quite like that. Players can't squish each other, and fireballs have no effect. Only the world and its inhabitants can hurt players, so it's more of an endurance match than anything else. Although, if you want to be a dick, you can send Koopa shells towards your fellow plumbers with great prejudice. The levels continue until only the last survivor remains, for there can only be one true Mario. Only one can be the very best, like Luigi never was. I admit, I haven't had an honest, proper session of the original game in quite a while and my skills are demonstrably rusty, leading to many incredibly embarrassing deaths. I was confident that I could wing through the first few stages without much difficulty, but my ego was quickly shattered. At launch, the netcode wasn't quite up to par yet. Players lagged out every few seconds, and trying to pull precise, death-defying jumps against moving enemies was a lost cause. So if you didn't want to blame yourself when you died, well, there you go. Still, it was completely playable and a fun new way to revisit this classic. I was concerned about when these problems would be fixed, or more importantly, if they would be fixed. Certainly not because of the creator's lack of interest, since in the past week the game already received significant updates, improving the netcode, performance and general stability. No. What made me wonder how far this project could go is the fact that various companies have shut down fan projects like this many times throughout the years. Actually, by bringing attention to Mario Royale with this video, I'm kind of contributing to the problem. I'm such a hypocrite. But I guess that it doesn't matter anymore. Six days after its launch, Nintendo sent a DMCA takedown to the developers. In short, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA, allows the owner of some sort of content to send out a DMCA takedown against either the owner of a website or the internet service provider that hosts the content without permission. Although, according to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act's official website, it doesn't actually require the content to be copyrighted. I don't get it. Regardless, in response to this, the game's assets were replaced with placeholders until the developers could complete the new ones, which I didn't get any footage of because I'm a moron who didn't see the obvious coming. Oh, and the name was changed to the MCA Royale. There couldn't be a more appropriate name. About a day or two later, the new assets were added. They still looked a lot like Mario assets, but supposedly this would have been enough to keep the lawyers off the creator's back. But it wasn't. Ripping pizzas. Another group of fans has since re-uploaded the original Mario Royale, but it's a very scaled down version that isn't quite the chaotic hellscape of the original. And who knows how long this will stay online. 
Anyway, what I want to say is that I think it's a shame that this project came to an end. Don't get me wrong, I'm aware that Nintendo is well within their rights to do it, given that, well, it's their IP, their brand, their franchise. I can't even use the excuse that it's an old game not being sold anymore because Super Mario Bros. has been available for purchase on many platforms throughout the years. There's also the fact that, while the game wasn't being sold for profit or anything, it did link to the creator's Patreon page, indirectly establishing a financial link between the game's infringing assets and the creator, automatically making it much worse from a legal standpoint. But what about from the point of view of an average gamer like me? Someone who doesn't know all the legal implications involving copyright protection? I think that interesting experiments like these should be preserved, encouraged and maybe even embraced by the companies involved, if it's legally and financially possible and doesn't step over the line. Fan projects are fan projects because, well, it's right there in the name. They are made by the people who love the products you've created, and they should be worn as a badge of honor rather than seeing them as a threat to your control of the copyright or trademark or whatever. I clearly don't know what I'm talking about. But my point is, I find it sad when I see projects like Another Metroid 2 Remake and Streets of Rage Remake getting the boot, because these projects didn't come from the developers just wanting 15 minutes of fame. People don't typically spend up to 10 years working on the same project if they just wanted someone to pat their backs. And game companies, come on, these projects could be good for you too. Instead of throwing them under the bridge, acknowledge their existence and offer a word of endorsement. The creators would be delighted to see that their work has the official seal of approval, the project would reach a bigger audience, and the company would be regarded as the good guys instead of the jerks that shut down a fan's years of work. In cases like the Metroid 2 remake, some speculate that the primary reason would be because Nintendo was working on their own remake. But I disagree. Both the fan remake and the official remake follow vastly different design choices, which in the end result in a different experience for the players, so they can exist alongside each other. Some might argue that letting AM2R into the wild would eat into Samus Returns' sales, but then again, if you have that little confidence in your product, then maybe there's something wrong with it. But these are full games I'm talking about, which are only part of the whole spectre of things that fan projects refers to. One major aspect of PC gaming that has continually been phased out over the years is modding. For the sake of simplicity, I'll include ROM hacking in the same category. Not the exact same thing, but the end results are fairly similar in that they both serve to modify an existing game. Mods have typically been a free product, distributed within communities built around the relevant games. One old example was the Planet series of websites, which hosted countless subsites for games such as Half-Life and Unreal. Today, it's unmaintained and full of dead links, and many of its mods have been lost to the ages. The reasons why these communities were so important to games' lifespans are fairly simple. The existence of mods offers more playtime. Maybe it adds more content, or maybe it modifies what already exists in the game. Maybe it allows veteran players to try something new instead of the same vanilla experience. Either way, seeing an interesting new mod is an excuse to boot up the game once more. In other words, it adds value to the product. Which is why I applaud SEGA for enabling Steam Workshop support for their Classics collection, and for letting fans work on official ports of Classic Sonic games and even the development of a brand new game. A big departure from hammering down on Streets of Rage Remake. And while they certainly take their time with number threes, Valve has acquired community projects, invested time and money into them and turned them into full commercial products. Very successful ones, in fact. They aren't the only ones who have done this, but they certainly are the most notable example. Hell, they don't even need to go that far. Simply spreading the word about worthwhile community projects would go a long way. As an example, you have the Unreal Tournament 2003 and 2004 community bonus packs, which were directly acknowledged and supported by Epic Games and Digital Extremes themselves. And now, I want to say something controversial. 
I think that, just like microtransactions and downloadable content, the idea of paid mods isn't necessarily evil. It's just that game companies have taken the concepts and dragged them down to absolute rock bottom, so every time I hear one of these words I immediately assume the worst. The Skyrim modding community is incredible, filled with talented artists that have contributed high quality content all these years. The sheer amount of mods you can find online is ridiculous, and surely there is something for everybody. In a perfect world, Bethesda's Creation Club would have been a celebration of that. Instead, it's horse armor all over again. Think about it. Many large-scale mods add the kind of content you would expect from a full-blown expansion pack or DLC add-ons. If Bethesda took the time to build a highly curated list of worthy mods and then collaborated with the developers by providing them with technical assistance, access to Bethesda's own development tools and a fair share of the profits, then they could have a winner on their hands. Fans of Skyrim would get new content, the developers would get a source of income and build up a resume for future employers, and Bethesda's wallet would keep growing. It would give Skyrim even more longevity and staying power, more incentives for the community to create high-quality content, and with Bethesda's help, it could easily be distributed to consoles instead of being limited to PC. And at that point, would the end result really be any different from official DLCs like Dawnguard? Again, they just need to take the time to pick the mods carefully, lest they end up with Hunt Down the Dragonborn or something. But no, some companies would rather sell you some pallet swaps for a few bucks instead of letting you download them for free from some modding site. Or even worse, give you the option to skip the grind, which honestly just baffles me. From my point of view, seeing the option to pay for regular in-game currency just comes off as an admission that the gameplay is too boring to enjoy the grind and that I should just skip it. But I digress. I started the script for this video with only the intention of talking about Mario Royale for a couple of minutes, and now here I am preaching to the choir about awful business practices. So yeah, what I wanted to say is that Nintendo, Sega or whoever else, if you see a fan project stepping on your legal domain, then do what you must. But I urge you to at least take a look at what that project means and what reception it got. Not all ideas are good ideas, but perhaps one of them might just have something in it for you. And let's face it, if Tetris can get its own battle royale, then so can Mario.